Welcome to the PharmaSource podcast. The use of AI and digital tools has now become normal in drug discovery. R&D has found machine learning to be a powerful tool in screening and optimizing compounds at scale. But manufacturing has been far slower to digitize. To understand what the potential is for digital transformation in biopharma manufacturing, we turn to Mark Buswell. Mark is head of digital CMC for NGT Biopharma Consultants and has significant experience in advanced manufacturing, including 20 years at GSK, where he was Vice President of Quality Control and QA Systems across GSK's global supply chain. Mark explains the largely untapped potential for digital CMC to accelerate late phase portfolios and shares the digital CMC framework he's developed with NGT, along with his advice on how to win hearts and minds in manufacturing when rolling out a transformative project. But first, here's a short message from our sponsor. The PharmaSource podcast is sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher Scientific provides industry-leading pharma services for drug development, clinical trial logistics, commercial manufacturing, and clinical research. They partner with customers in the pharmaceutical, biotech, and life sciences industries as their trusted CDMO to deliver medicine to patients faster. Back to our interview with Mark Buswell. Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the Farm Source podcast today. Great to have you. Hi, Luke. Great to be here and uh, looking forward to the chat today. Absolutely. To start with then, Mark, so you've got a lot of experience working through companies like GSK, where you were for, for quite some time, working through R&D and, and manufacturing. It'd be great to understand a bit about your experience and how that's brought you to where you are now, please. Yeah, thanks, Luke. So, um, so yes, I uh, I uh, chemical engineer by training. I joined uh, GSK in 2002 and had a, had a great career there, worked there for some 21 years. Uh, I should say I've left GSK now. So uh, mm-hmm. at, at the moment, I'm working with NGT Biopharma Consultants, uh, where I'm he- heading up a digital CMC service. And that's a new service, isn't it? Yeah, that is a new service that uh, NGT are um, creating. And it's yeah. looking to help organizations uh, in the CMC function uh, help them navigate digital transformation uh, and help them um, put their strategies together for how they're going to uh, exploit digital to drive their CMC CMC functions forward. So that's a new service that we're um, that we're creating and pulling together. Hmm. Uh, but just going back to the experience, uh, so yeah, c- c- came came into the industry as a chemical engineer, started in developments, uh, laboratory facing, uh, doing API drug substance development, scale up, tech transfer into manufacturing. I uh, had a lot of experience with advanced manufacturing technologies, so did a lot of work around continuous processing, a lot of work in biologics around um, purification technologies, analytical technologies, et cetera. Uh, and, then, and then interestingly, and this is where my, my perspective gets a little bit different, interestingly, I had an opportunity to join an IT function. So I went from a kind of business-facing CMC development role into the R&D IT department at GSK, uh, where I was accountable for all of the preclinical IT systems supporting discovery um, and development, preclinical development. Uh, and then later on in my career, I moved across into the vaccines division at GSK, where I had accountability end-to-end for all of the IT systems that supported the whole whole division. So that's given me quite a unique blend of CMC development manufacturing experience, but then also uh, a lot of experience around the IT systems that support that, um, which is how I got into this kind of digital transformation aspect. Yeah. So when you were applying different technologies to drug development, what areas were you working on there? Where were you seeing traction? What were the priorities? Yeah, I, I think when I first moved in there, um, in any anybody in an IT uh, function at any pharmaceutical company will know that your agenda is always split between maintaining what we call technical currency. So this is where you've deployed an IT system. And, and you'll know from your personal IT experience there's an update to your software every two years. You're always, you know, your your Apple phone is always being upgraded. You're always being expected to reinvest in the next version. So, a lot of IT de- departments are spending a lot of time maintaining what they already have, right? So upgrades, uh, periodic upgrades to systems, and then the other the other side of your your job is investing in new capabilities, right? So these are new emerging technologies. It might be cloud based systems. I mean, we're probably going to talk about AIML because that's the that's the latest wave of technology that's washing it across the industry. Um, and, and actually, my experience is you, you, you'll you be surprised how hungry the maintaining the technical currency side of, of the uh, agenda is, right? If you're not mm. careful, you can be spending 80%, 90% of your time and investment just maintaining what you have. Uh, and, and, and I think that's uh, 
that's an interesting dynamic that I observed. And I think that's where, you know, we talk about digital CMC. That is going to be a challenge because you take, a, um, you know, you take the last two decades, we've invested in basically what I'd call digitizing laboratory environments, right? So I'm trying to take our laboratory environments paperless and at least getting the CMC data digital. And that, so what I'm talking about there is the, um, uh, the deployment of electronic lab notebook. So when I started in GSK in 2002, I was given a, an orange paper lab notebook and I would literally use a pen and I'd write my experiments up. Of course, today, I'd like to say all of our scientists, but I would rather say most of our scientists across the industry are using electronic notebooks, but you'll be surprised. We still have paper-based logbooks and notebooks in, in, in you know deployed in laboratory environments. Mm. So they're not 100% paperless yet. But nevertheless, we went over, uh, I think in the last two decades, a lot of the focus has been on simply driving um, a lot of the data to be digital in the first place. And so ELN systems, LIM systems, scientific data management systems, sample management systems. So just digitizing the basic workflow. That's the journey we've been on in the last two decades. I, I you know, and I, and I guess we'll we'll get to the current state now, but to give you a little snippet on that, whilst that was good and we got a lot of gains in terms of efficiency and we got a lot of gains in terms of data integrity, that is starting to plateau now. And one of the reasons that's starting to plateau is is that we ended up creating quite strong data silos across the CMC workflows. Uh, and I think if you want to, if we want to get into discussion about where things are going now, trying to dismantle those data silos and getting data to flow is a, is a really big hot topic in the industry at the moment. But if we just talk generally, there's always this challenge with IT investments around tangible versus intangible benefit and and short versus long term benefit. Right now, anybody who's who's ever done a business case for any sort of investment in in any sort of corporate company will know that the strongest business cases are when you have tangible short term business benefit. Right, that that is gonna that is gonna be very helpful. A lot of IT investment tries to initially build its case based on resource efficiency. Right, so if you can um, if you can find ways to do things more efficiently and you can reduce the amount of resource required to execute workflows, that's where a lot of your efficiency comes from in the first place. A lot of those sorts of savings that, that we were talking about there, they come from um, transform transformation of the actual IT department itself, right? So there's two different costs here. There's the cost for the IT department, but then there's also the the cost of a of of a, of a section of the of the business um, that, that needs to be addressed, right? Okay. Now, when you get into deployment of systems, you know that 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 depends, right? It depends whether you're talking about in manufacturing or whether you're talking in R and D. So there's always going to be um, the potential for a resource efficiency savings lever mm -hmm. right so that effectively means that you can do the same or more amount of work with less people so you get an employment cost saving right that's that's always going to be a potential driver for technology investment but that's not the only driver and certainly if you look in the manufacturing space um, there's a lot of very powerful drivers around enhancing yield of manufacturing or um, enhancing downtime um, you know those those sorts of tangible business benefits are, 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 are very lucrative when you get into the r d side it gets much more challenging because of course r d is not um you know it's not really a revenue point for the company it's it's really just a cost uh, a cost site for r d r d doesn't generate revenue in its own right um of course it, it generates ip and it transfers that across to our commercial and manufacturing organizations and and, and then that's where the revenue comes from but r d is basically a cost mm -hmm. right so the only way to make business cases in r d is to reduce cost or to go after um, portfolio, either portfolio acceleration uh, or improving the probability of, of, of portfolios being successful. Now, in R&D, that's hard because, as you know, the timelines are quite long, right? Mm -hmm. So you imagine trying to convince someone that an IT investment is going to accelerate your pipeline. You know, that's going to take 10 years to read out, right? Maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. Who knows, right? So so I think IT investments in the R&D space are, are quite challenging because of the nature of the business. It's quite, it can be quite difficult to draw a thread to tangible short-term benefit. Which is interesting because there is a lot of investment, t tends to be, at that early stage of discovery, whereas manufacturing certainly seems to be lagging behind when it comes to digital transformation of manufacturing processes. Yeah. Why is there so much focus generally with AI, machine learning on, the, on that drug discovery phase? And it seems to be a lot harder to actually shift the gears in manufacturing. Yeah, it's, it's a simple culture piece. And, and I imagine this dynamic plays out in just about every industry sector, right? So if you if you think about it, the culture in R&D is they are very comfortable with managing risk. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, just, just think about it this way. What, what's the statistic? Um, one in a thousand compounds that enter development will actually make it through to commercialization, right? So the attrition rates are so high. So I think 
I think generally R and D is much more comfortable with managing investment risk, whether that's investment in assets or investments in technology. That that is the business that discovery is in, right? Um, and uh, and so I think they're much more comfortable with, you know, much more strategic long term investments in technology. So be that you know big big investments in in um, access to genetic information or um, you know, human genome type type information or or big investments in clinical trials, phase three clinical trials run to millions of pounds. You've got no guarantee of a successful outcome, right? So I think the culture in R and D is a little bit different, um, especially in the in the discovery space, which I think does make it more amenable. Mm-hmm. To um, to these types of strategic investments, I think in manufacturing, all manufacturing uh, organizations are all pretty similar, right? They are they are very, um, you know, manufacturing executives first of all are pretty conservative bunch by by nature, which which you'd hope they would be, right? Because they're all about you know operational efficiency, uptime. Um, normally, margins are quite tight for manufacturing, mm-hmm. right? So certainly, most pharma companies will 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 kind of manage their manufacturing operations to a very tight margin. Uh, and I think that just generates a, um, a, a sort of a healthy skepticism in manufacturing decision makers around whether investments in technology are going to pay back or not. And they don't want to make any investments. They have no capacity to tolerate investment that doesn't give them a payback. Whereas I think that the culture and discovery is, is very different, right? They have a much bigger tolerance and capacity to bear investments that that, that turn out to be wrong in the end, right? So the it's almost like the burden of proof for return on investment is much higher in the manufacturing space than it is in the R&D space. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, what would you say the current state is of CMC at the moment? The perspective that you've got now having left GSK and moving into consulting, presumably you see a, a wider cross-section of companies. Where would you say people are in their transition? Yeah, I, I um, most people are fully digitized or are in the process of fully digitizing. Right. So mm-hmm. what I mean by that is most of the industry is pretty much adopted limb systems, ELN systems, and those those kind of base base systems. I think some of the smaller, what I would call kind of greenfield companies, are finding it easier to invest in more sophisticated systems because they don't have this legacy brownfield of systems that are, you know, but the, the problem I mentioned before, right? They I think if you're a if you're a small company, um and you're starting to invest in your systems from a from a greenfield perspective. That is a lot easier to put in a modern end to end kind of CMC IT system enablement. I think for lo- some of the larger companies, trying to um, trying to life cycle their legacy systems and move to more modern systems is is, is a real challenge, right? And you take a you, know, you take a big limb system that you might deploy in a large pharma company. Um, yeah, that's a that that's like a five to ten year investment, right? It's gonna well, first of all, it's gonna take you about five years probably to deploy it, or maybe maybe three years to deploy it. But then you're gonna live with it for the next ten years. It's not easy to change that mm. um, midway through. And if you think about the pace at which te- technology is evolving, you know, imagine um, imagine if I told you, okay, here's your iPhone, uh, but you, you're gonna have to keep it for ten years. You you would bulk at that that, that, yeah, that yeah. concept, right? Because we've seen how you know, iPhones have evolved over ten years. It's incredible how quickly they evolve, um, and it's no different actually. So I think large pharma companies tend to get locked into systems for a fairly long period of time, and then it's quite difficult for them to replatform. Hmm. Um, so I think where where I I think people are pushing to now, I think most organisations have gone through a journey of um, you know creating a, a data lake. So trying to create a, a sort of a data platform capability, mm-hmm. I think I think a lot of organisations have probably bumped into the same problem, which is if you just hoover up all the CMC data and put it into a data lake, the the value adding use cases don't necessarily just fall out. We can talk a bit more about that. And I I think if you go back sort of five to seven years, there was a a little bit of a a little bit of a hype that if you just if you just unlocked all the siloed CMC data and you just dumped it in a data lake, then the data scientists would be able to exploit that and, and get mm. some value. And I, I think the shines come off that a little bit. I think there's a realization that actually you need to be a bit more targeted about what data you go and get and why you want to get it. And you and you almost need to have a little bit of an understanding why you want to get it in the first place. And and I, and you know we can we can get into this. Um, I I I uh, I like to turn the strapline around where a lot of organizations. Have been struggling with defining their data strategy. Mm-hmm. And we, can, we can have a discussion about what even a data strategy actually is, but but nevertheless, you hear a lot of people saying, "Oh, we don't have a data strategy. We need to find a data strategy." And and a lot of organisations are, start, are trying to going are trying to go after this idea of data driven decision making. Right? They want to make decisions in CMC based off of of data. 
And so they want a data strategy that's going to enable that. And and in a way, in that, they almost have the answer to the data strategy conundrum, which is if you just switch it around and say, right, you want a decision-driven data strategy, then that tells you what your data strategy should be, right? And what I mean by that is you should be saying to yourself, okay, in CMC, what decisions do we actually need to make, right? We need to make decisions around modality, you know, uh, route of manufacture, synthesis route. Um, we need to make decisions about when we file and launch, impurity profile, stability, formulations, et cetera. So there's, so there's lots of decisions we need to make. We want to make those decisions with the best data available. So your data strategy should simply be about how do you make sure you have the end-to-end -end flow of the data that you need to make the decisions, right? Um, and that, uh, what I like about that as well is that, that that turns the definition of the data strategy into a more senior management level conversation rather than a kind of grassroots um, bottom-up build of data strategy, which I think is is where a lot of organizations have struggled, is that they've pushed that, that, um, that definition of data strategy, they've pushed that down into the organization rather than keeping it at a, at a relatively senior level. I think there's definitely a cultural piece there. I mean, the, the example I always think of with that is Netflix and how whenever Netflix release a new show or a new series, they'll have a sort of almost like a, a war room where their execs are all together looking at the data, making data-driven decisions on, on what they're doing. How well do you see data-driven decision-making happening at that leadership level? Do you see executives who are referring to dashboards on a weekly daily cadence no i think that's that's where culturally we've got a long way to go right um i think there's a there's a sort of a a, a, a leadership capability journey that that um that we need to support cmc leaders to go through so most cmc leaders probably would struggle to access modern data platforms and modern kind of dashboard platforms right so i think a lot of cmc decision making is still being done very statically off powerpoint slides so project teams are you know, compiling information manually, putting it into a static PowerPoint slide, submitting it, you know, a week in advance of the meeting and then going to the meeting, having a discussion. I think we are, generally speaking, a long way off from senior CMC leaders being comfortable and capable to navigate a dynamic data platform with CMC information in real time, right? I think, I think that is a leadership capability journey that the industry is going to have to go through. Um, I think the... Uh, you know, I think you you asked me a little bit about current status CMC, and, and and we should say actually, I mean maybe maybe one plug for CMC. I mean CMC works, right? So so CMC in the industry works really well. CMC is very rarely on the critical path of drug development. Generally speaking, if our discovery colleagues can get all the you know the efficacy and the safety correct and get the right targets and the right modality, generally CMC will deliver. Um, mm -hmm. a, 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 a safe and efficacious medicine. So so to some extent CMC works. Um, and so I wouldn't want to give people the wrong the wrong impression here. And, and actually, that is the challenge because I think at a at a sort of cultural level within CMC, there is a little bit of a sentiment: well, if it's not broken, don't fix it, right? Mm -hmm. And that I think is holding back a little bit the um, you know generally across the industry, CMC functions and manufacturing organisations. That maybe also feeds into the into the culture a little bit about well, it's worked, it's worked for the last 50 years. What, you know, why do we need to modernize it? Why do we need to change it? But, but of course, there are compelling reasons why we need to modernize it. Right? How would you break down those benefits when it comes to digital transformation? What are the main areas that someone should be looking at? And why bother, basically, Mark, with all this complicated transformation stuff? Yeah, I think there's, um, there's a couple of potent things. One is uh, acceleration. Right, acceleration of, of portfolios through late phase. So most, you, you know, you mentioned the investments that have gone into the front end of the discovery. I do think those uh, investments in genetics, functional genomics, and the AI ML investments that have been made in the, in those domains is generating a significant increase in the number of targets that we can go after, and mm -hmm. they're targets that have very good genetic validation. So very, very good likelihood of success if we can get them into the clinic. Those, those, those that that portfolio of assets is is maturing now and is moving into the CMC space. So there's a real opportunity to accelerate some of those uh, medicines through to patients, right? So I would say, why bother? Because we can do things faster, right? We can get these assets to to our patients much faster if we if we exploit uh, digital technologies. I think the other, and actually, COVID is a is a great example, right? You look at the pace at which we brought mRNA through. Um, I don't mean to say that that's all because of digital. What I mean to say is it, it, it that just demonstrates that it is possible if you have the will and you can um, you can you can get yourself mobilized. Uh, I think you can accelerate assets, and I think digital has a has a big role to play in in helping that acceleration. 
Um, I think the other uh, opportunity is there is a, I don't want to overstate it because I think generally speaking, medicines, you know, we, well, the whole, the whole point of, of regulatory approval for medicine is you've demonstrated efficacy and safety. But I think there is an opportunity to um, develop better and, and more robust medicines using digital technologies. I'm, t- I'm particularly talking about simulation technologies. So the ability to, um, to simulate dose forms means that potentially we can get enhancements in the, um, in the in the quality and the design of the drug products. So that's another potent reason to to go after digital. And then, and I think the other problem is is um, CMC organisations are under pressure in terms of resource efficiency, uh, in the sense that most big pharma companies are looking to invest in the early stage pipelines. Uh, margins are getting tighter, so payers, you know, the whole the whole dynamics, economics of the drug drug industry is getting a little tighter, and that is pushing putting pressure. And so, I think a lot of CMC functions are under pressure to, you know, do more with with at least the same, or perhaps possibly with less, right? So most CMC functions have kind of shrunk in size a little bit, um, but they're still expecting to, to to deliver a significant amount of workflow. And if you want to if you want to still deliver the same amount of output without the quality of the CMC outcomes deteriorating, you're going to have to reach for digital solutions to, 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 to help you um, unlock that. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. the other the other potent reason as well is there are a lot of interesting um, sort of emerging companies that, uh, you know, if you look for innovation in the small biotechs and startups, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, if those first two, two issues that I mentioned were sort of, um, were sort of pull issues, I think there's push as well. Right, this push of technology, uh, and I think there's a chance of disruption. Right, there's a, there's an ability for people to disrupt competitors if they embrace digital CMC. Something that you and NGT shared recently was a digital CMC maturity framework, and in that, there's sort of various different steps on that maturity journey, and with each step comes a more transformative level of business value. Starting with lab digitization automation at one side, all the way through to generative AI derived CMC output. Interesting if you could just sort of like talk around that framework, please explain some of those different steps on that journey. Yeah, no, happy to. Um, so this is something we've put together to help uh, organizations understand where they might be, where they need to go next and, and, and where they need to strengthen. And and I should say, although, you know, the, the the nature of our thinking is it tends to be laid out linearly, but of course there's many different pathways through this, right? And there's different kind of yeah. combinations. This. But basically speaking, we see um, a developing maturity which starts with lab digitization and automation, and I and I and I think that's the that's that basic point I made before, which is, you know, if you're still based on paper-based pack- capture of data, it's going to be very difficult to get any sort of more sophisticated system to do anything with that, right? If if, if you're still capturing data on paper, so table stakes in terms of digital maturity for CMC is getting your data, your CMC data digitized deploying um, automation platforms in the lab so that you can execute CMC experiments uh, uh, quickly and efficiently. Yeah, I think if you move on from that, the next step that a lot of organizations went through uh, and certainly have been going in parallel um, is is around modeling and digital design, right? So anything you can do to avoid wet experimentation and do your experimentation in silico is going to save you time and money and it's going to get you good outcomes. And, and actually, that's an interesting point around automation, lab digitization automation, because you know, when I joined this this industry as a as a young development scientist, a lot of the time you would do experiments um, to try and answer a question related to something. Right? It might be control of an impurity. It might you know whatever uh, process conditions. But there has been a change over the last twenty years. Now we are interested in doing experiments in order to train and design a model. That could be an empirical model where we need to understand a certain parameter in the model. It could be an engineering model. So, for example, you might do a filtration study. In, um, in API CMC, but it's actually about generating the parameters to describe the physical properties of the of the crystalline materials that you're developing, and then you will use the model to actually predict what the what the large scale performance is going to be. Right. So the so the nature, and that's why I think this automation piece is quite powerful because it allows you to do design of experiments type um, uh, type work. Which then allows you to build statistical models for the process that you're trying to optimize. So so I think those two kind of go hand in hand. I think when you move beyond that, and, and actually I should say when that first came in, right? So over the um, over the mid sort of two thousands, that lab digitization and that modeling and, and digital design did have a transformative business value impact. The problem is now, if you dial forward to to, to twenty twenty four, 
the impact of doing more investment in that space is kind of diminishing a little bit, right? Most organizations are already exploiting those two those two pieces. And apart from just maintaining them, there's not a lot of additional transformative business value in, in my view. The next yeah, I guess piece they're, would, they're, they're foundational, would you say? They're foundational, yeah, they're foundational. Um, now, the next piece on that is around the CMC data model. Um, th- this is a big challenge for the industry, and, and, and a lot of people will echo this point. We have struggled to create a standardized CMC data model across the industry. So what that means mm. is calling the same things the same thing, right? So, And this is even within companies. Right? So even within a company between do, two different systems, you will find that various entities within the CMC sort of data domain are referred to using different names and tags. And and that is, a as we talk about higher up the maturity curve, that tends to be a problem. Now, it's not a problem if the data stays siloed in a single system, right? So if you've just... You know, if you've just got a limb system and you're going in and you're looking at your analytical data in the limb system, fine, right? As long as the data model within that limb system is is consistent, it's not an issue. However, if you want to start taking data out of a limb system and you want to start merging it with data that's coming out of an ERP system or out of a, 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 an ELN system, if you are referring to the same thing using different data tags, that gets very confusing for SMEs, let alone um, uh, more sophisticated digital systems, right? So this idea of trying to get a standardized data model is is really important. One of the frustrations which we talk about a lot is around tech transfers. Mm -hmm. Even with that tech transfer, if it's in the same facility or or within the same contract manufacturer, that can be a challenge, let alone moving it from one CMO to to another or or bringing it in-house. That data just doesn't exist. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, interesting enough, even within companies, you'll find the data model that is used within a subset of CMC, which is analytical sciences, right? So you just look at the analytical method description um, and, uh, and, you know, you get instances where companies in R&D and manufacturing were using the same limb system, but will have different method data models deployed in the R&D and the manufacturing side. And then you imagine you get to tech transfer, you would have thought it'd be easy to tech transfer the method from one limb system to the other limb system, but you discover actually they've been built on on a different data model philosophy. Hmm. And that that causes big problems. And, that, and that's within company. Can you imagine if you were trying to do insourcing and outsourcing of manufacturing across across the CMO network? It's a real challenge. Now, um, a, a lot of companies have been putting some work into this. So a lot of companies have been trying to at least internally get a consistent CMC data model across their systems. And that's that's been, um, you know, certainly makes a lot of the data analytics uh, use cases that we want to pursue a lot easier. But there are some really interesting signs externally where various in- industry consortiums are coming together now to try and create an industry standard. And I, I think it's similar. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a, a massive expert on, on the clinical side, but I think clinical, probably driven more by the regulators, we're much faster to standardize the data model for clinical. And I guess that's that's because of the clinical submission paradigm and the way in which the regulators wanted that data to be submitted. But I think at CMC, we've we've missed that a little bit. And I think, like I said, I think there's some consortiums that are that are coming together to try and address that. And, and I think the regulators are starting to um, push us down that path because they want to get to um, structured content submission. Yeah. Um, and so they want to standardize that, right? CMC data model and, and standardization, could that facilitate a change to how regulatory submissions are delivered? It could do. Um, so uh, I know certainly the FDA and I believe the EMEA have both um, published some position papers around their thoughts on moving that. I, th- I think it'll be quite gradual, though, and quite cautious. So uh, I believe the FDA were proposing um, stability analytical spec data would be the first kind of components or modules of the of the CMC section that they would want to sort of standardize the submission format on and move to a fully structured electronic submission on. Um, but I, I, I think it'll come. I think it's the way to go. Um, actually, I think, you know, I think it helps the industry, both both sides, both regulator and industry. It, it helps us. Um, of course, there's going to be some teething pain as we get our system set up to to, to facilitate that. But I, I, I think that's the way it's going to go. What could that mean for the industries? If we're able to send faster, much more regular regulatory submissions, does that have a potential knock-on effect on how quickly processes can be changed within the manufacturer? What could that all mean? I'm not sure about how quickly processes could be necessarily changed, but I, I think... Um, my understanding, and and you know, I don't I don't want to speak for regulators, but from what I've read of the regulated re- regulatory position papers, um, the uh, there is the hint that it's going to a provide more consistency of review mm-hmm. because it'll be easier for them to to sort of standardize the review outcomes across across multiple um, uh, assets and products, which which I think is good. Um, potentially, 
it allows an acceleration of the re the review process. So they're mm. not going to have to kind of wrangle our data or anything like that. So as the industry submits the data, it's exactly in the format that facilitates the fastest review possible. So consistency, speed of review, um, and 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 I think there's got to be a there's got to be a um, there's got to be a sort of a, an enhancement and transparency here, which is going to get get a get get a you know the, a higher likelihood of getting the right decision has got to be good for for patients and patient outcomes, right? Um, so I think those are probably the three drivers there. In terms of whether that accelerates post approval changes, um, yeah, I, I guess for the same reason, perhaps because you know you get a you get a you get a you get an increased transparency and you get an ability to to submit data and and facilitate a faster faster review. Maybe, maybe that will give you more flexibility. But I I wouldn't want to overstate that though because I think you know. The whole the whole design for manufacture and quality by design paradigm was was supposed to facilitate that, but it, it didn't it didn't necessarily quite work out like that. Um, but I think on the industry side, it, it is going to be very helpful because the the amount of manual data transcription and checking that is that is involved in submitting data to regulators is 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 just cannot be overstated, right? It's it chews up a huge amount of time. So if we can, and that's and this is why even without the regulators and it, requesting this companies are still going down this path because they recognize yeah. how much data integrity challenge there is here with manual transcription of data. It is a real problem. Um, so anything we can do to, to, to standardize on a CMC data model and get data to flow in a sort of hands, you know, hands off kind of fashion, um, and then we can validate those data pipelines that that is going to, that is going to help the industry massively. So then what's a CMC knowledge management platform? How, uh, are there any examples of that? Yeah, that, that's the, um, that's the next uh, level of evolution here. And we, we're really talking about um, or what I mean by that, right, is, you know, today, uh, most farm organizations in the CMC departments are very document driven, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, we have workflows, those workflows execute, uh, scientists will write a report, the report gets published and the report gets put in an archive. So, so all the knowledge is kind of in in documents right and and there's this interesting co uh, quote that i heard recently which is what's the source of the truth are systems the source of the truth or, or or documents the source of the truth and unfortunately there is still a very strong culture and mindset that it's the final reviewed document that's the source of the truth rather than the system and i think what i mean by cmc knowledge management is trying to shift that almost to a mentality where we um we generate documents on demand but actually, the mm -hmm. source of the truth is residing in the system. And I, and I think you asked me some examples there. I think what you see in aerospace and automotive is much more impressive in terms of um, their sort of product lifecycle management and the way in which they orchestrate the development of a new product, be that a car or, or, or an engine for an airplane, the way in which they manage the knowledge in a single platform all the way through the lifecycle of the product from from in, you know, in our case, discovery, in their case, I guess it's early product development, all the way through to commercialization of that product. The pharma industry has has not invested in those sorts of end-to-end -end integrated systems to manage the CMC knowledge all the way through the life cycle of an asset. And that's what I'm talking about here. And um, and, and like I said, I think uh, you know, there's other sectors like automotive and aerospace that have been much more effective at doing that. Finally, as we go up the curve, then there's digital twins and generative AI and how that can make a difference to CMC output. Could you explain those two different terms, please, and what you mean by them in a CMC context? Yeah, absolutely. So digital twins, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about modeling and digital design at the bottom end. So I think the, the distinction between modeling and digital twins is that when we talk about uh, modeling, we're really talking about a single sub process, and it might be typically tends to be an empirical model or, or a mechanistic model. When we talk about mm -hmm. digital twins, I think we, you know, my my, you know, my interpretation of that is we, we're we're really talking about whole system modeling, right? So we're allowing multiple subsystems to be modeled in their own right and then interact in a, in a sort of a whole system model. Um, now that could be, you know, digital twin could be at a at a sort of a factory level. It could all the way be down to a a, a sort of a, um, a sort of a process digital twin, uh, if if you like. But uh, but I think the key point is the interaction between subsystem models. And I think the other interesting thing about digital twins is, is we got a little bit, um, to some extent, we got a little bit stuck around modeling and digital design because we were only relying on empirical and mechanistic models. I think digital twins relaxes that a little bit and saying, well, look, if you're trying to do a whole system model, there may be certain subsystems in this, in this overall system that are not amenable to empirical and mechanistic modeling, but we can put a statistical based machine learning model in place 
and and, and a sort of sort of a black box type model approach, mm. and we can we can slot that in and allow it to interact with mechanistic and and, and and empirical models, and still give us an effective simulation of the overall system. I think the other interesting thing about digital twins is it implies um, a sort of a dynamic real time link to an actual physical process, which is quite interesting. So if you think about the digital twin for a process. You would have process analytical techniques, which would be measuring something in real time on a process. Those measurements can be fed into the digital twin in real time. So it's a it's a, it's a sort of a real time simulation of the actual physical process that's going on. And I, and I think it has huge applications in, in CMC, mostly around the manufacturing space, right? The control of complex processes. Um, there's some really interesting applications there. Where you can you can uh, use all the modeling you've done on the different subsystems, assemble them together to give you an overall um, system model, and then you can optimize that system uh, for whatever whatever driver of manufacturing that you're looking to go for. I think the other thing that's interesting in digital twins is is this this idea of cognitive automation. Um, mm-hmm. So what that basically means is is, is automating decision making, right? Um, it's a sophisticated name for that. Uh, and uh, and and what I mean by that is and and, and yeah, before anybody gets worried. Chemical engineers have been automating decision making for for decades, right? It's just it was called process control in its simplest form, right? So we've had um, digital systems that have made decisions around controlling temperature of reactors and all that kind of thing as well. So it's not a it's not as a scary concept as maybe people might might think. Um, but it, it you know what I mean by this in in a CMC capability perspective is is allowing systems to at least make a recommendation of what action should be taken. Or actually automate the action in, in 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 itself. Now, I think in terms of process control, that's kind of pretty pretty simple, and we already do that. Where where I think cognitive automation is quite interesting is if it starts to play out in the actual um, the actual management of the CMC workflows across the across the phases. So what I mean by that is is imagine a system where you know let's say you're running a stability study, early early phase stability study for an asset. You get a readout of stability today. Uh, an SME or a scientist will review that that readout of stability data and then make a decision about you know whether whether we need to go and change something in terms of the storage conditions or whatever the case is. Right, take we'll take whatever action. But imagine if the system actually gave you a recommendation and said, "Oh, this stability data come, has come in." The system has analysed it and based on previous you know previous knowledge of how assets progress. You should probably take this action, which is to trigger some some follow-on study, right? That that type of cognitive automation, um, we don't see in CMC at the moment. Interestingly enough, you do see it in supply chain management. There are a lot of interesting supply chain management software systems coming up, which do have cognitive automation. So, for instance, the system will say, you know, inventories at a certain node in your supply chain seem to have dropped to a certain level. Um, the next, the, the action you need to take is you need to transfer stock from this place to that place, mm. right? So, so, so sort of auto, and, and in some cases, it might actually trigger that automatically. It might say to you, you know, the system might say to a, to a supply chain executive, stock is reduced at this node. You know, we've, you know, the system has already initiated a transfer of stock from that warehouse to that warehouse, and 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 you're just being informed, right? And you can reverse the decision if you want. So that's what I mean by cognitive automation, and and trying to deploy that in a in a CMC development paradigm, I think, is a really interesting opportunity. Any examples that you're aware of where that's happening right now in manufacturing? No, not in manufacturing and CMC. I think that's an opportunity. I think the first yeah. step is to is to start to deploy digital twins, because I think it comes off the back of digital twins, right? I think if you've got a digital twin, um, and remember, digital twins. This is the interesting concept of digital twins: is that they they operate over a vast range of scales, right? So you can have a digital twin of your whole manufacturing network, all the way down to the digital twin of a single factory, all the way down to a digital twin of a single process, mm. right? Mm. Um, and I think, and, and I think, broadly in the in the farm industry, we're we're really at the start of deployment of digital twin technologies um, to to control. The only the only examples I've seen are more process digital twins, where you know we might be modeling a fermentation system, or we might might be modeling some some sort of um, uh, process formulation process. Um, uh, but I but right. I think there's opportunities to 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 sort of move up the hierarchy and start to start to to stitch these digital twins together to give you a whole factory performance simulation, which I think is when you start getting into some of the interesting cognitive automation pieces. When you're working with a, a customer, where do you start in identifying where the ROI will come from, where you need to focus in terms of reinventing workflows? 
Where would you begin? There's so many different technologies and approaches that we've just discussed in the last sort of 30 minutes. Where, where would you start? Yeah, that's and that is the challenge, right? And that's exactly what we're interested in helping clients with. Um, I mean, I think you've got to start with the business context and the and the and the pressures you're under. I think for any CMC department, I would always start with the the pipeline, right? What is the work that is facing you that's got to get executed, um, and and what are those what are those decisions and those points that you need to do? And I and I think this is my my top tip for any organization is always anchor your investments in your portfolio and your assets. And the closer you can get it to specific assets, the better, right? So what I mean by that is, you know, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're facing a discussion about, okay, we know we need to invest in digital systems and we know it's going to help us to accelerate um, assets and achieve higher probability success, et cetera, make it real in terms of saying, okay, which assets, right? You, you, you know, mm. most CMC departments will know what assets they're going to be working on over the next five years. The nature of the timeline is such that you know that, right? So, so the way to make this real is to actually pick a specific asset and say, okay, if we really believe that digital is going to help us accelerate our portfolio, explain that in terms of this asset, right? What has this asset got to go through over the next five years, right? What what work do we need to complete? What submissions do we need to make? Draw out that timeline and then really challenge yourself around, okay, so what we're saying is we want to make investments because we want to accelerate this asset, not, not, not the generic the assets, but this asset. And I think as soon as you do that, you start to really um, – you start to get real about the challenge and what you really need to do, and then and then I think you can use that and you can go to a maturity model and say, okay, I don't know. Let's so let's just talk. Um, you know, just a simple example. Let's let's say you, the context for a certain client is that is that they want to accelerate a certain late fade asset, which is very important to the future of the company. Um, and then and then you look at the timelines and you say, okay, what's the what's the opportunity for acceleration? Let's assume the clinical side of the business is doing their own acceleration, right? So they're going to be ready for file and launch. The phase three study will read out and all the rest of it. And then you're going to need to tech transfer and file and launch. Then you can start to say, okay, you know, our our tech transfer timeline is on critical path now, mm-hmm. right? So then the question is, right? Well, how do we do tech transfer today? How can we reinvent that to do it in a timeline that's going to be you know business transformative in terms of value? Um, and then you can start to drill down to okay, what what technology investments do we need to make to to do that? Now, if you take tech transfer, that could be, well, clearly we need to you know we want to use generative AI to to write the the recipes and the tech transfer instructions. It could, could be right. I don't I don't know if that's viable or not. Or it could be, actually, we want to use digital twins to do that. Or it could just be you know we just need to get all the data into a consistent data, CMC data model and and transfer that across. Or 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 it could be that actually we don't, um, you know, we might be doing sort of fermentation development and we might not have digitized the fermentation lab, right? Mm. So so then you could say, right, it's going to, it's the, the investment is going to be digitize your specific fermentation lab so that you get digital data for the fermentation of that assets process. And then you can use that to drive modeling and simulation and you can get a better outcome in tech transfer. So that would be my um, my advice, Luke, is to always, always anchor it in the specific work and assets and the specific context of what you're trying to achieve and then and then and then drop into the maturity curve and understand what parts of the maturity curve do you need to make investments to get the to get the transformative business value that you're looking for and on the flip side to that if there's one mistake which you see people making time and time again what would that be what's something that people should avoid at all costs probably the biggest mistake i see is an inability or a reluctance to reinvent process you know, a lot of technology invent- investment is well intended, but then it basically gets blunted by, you know, it's the classic problem of a- anybody in IT will tell you, redesign your business process to match the system. Don't try and bend the system to match the process, right? So I, I, the biggest mistake I've seen is people hanging on to the previous iteration of a process and then you bring new technology in and you almost blunt the power of the new technology because you force that technology to work in a, in a, in a sort of an old process paradigm. So, and it's, and it's hard, right? The reason people make the mistake again and again is it's very hard to, to reimagine that process. But I think, I think the more time you can spend reinventing and reimagining how you're going to get work done before you start piling in with the, with the technology investment, I think that that's the thing that, that makes the biggest impact. Um, and then linked to that reimagination, I think is is how you're going to manage the adoption. So the uh, you know I've worked walked around factories and seen well intentioned technology, and the screen is literally covered in dust and pushed against the wall. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I've, I've literally seen that in factories, uh, and uh, and so that you know thinking through 
not just thinking through what investments you're going to make, but 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 how how are the people going to actually use those? So so you know, I was doing some work on a supply chain system that we were thinking about doing an investment on, and and the the asset test question is, okay, so explain to me these these are all the people we have working in supply chain. These are all the typical roles we have. Which particular role specifically is going to use this system? And explain to me how they're going to use it. And when I say how they're going to use it, I mean they arrive at 8 o'clock in the morning, they go get themselves a cup of coffee, they sit down at their desk and they start checking their emails. At what point in the day are they going to log into this system and actually use it? And when you ask that question, that's quite sobering, right? Because that starts to make you really think quite deeply about, okay, what actually is the workflow here? How do these people actually yeah. work? And how are they actually going to use this system and integrate it into their, literally into their day-to-day -day work? And I, and I do push it to the hour. Like, okay, so what time of the day are they going to log in, right? Are they going to log in at four o'clock, nine o'clock? And people look at you a bit oddly going, well, why are you asking that question? I'm like, no, because that that is the reality of of people coming to work, right? They they turn up at about eight, nine o'clock, whatever the case is, or log in in the morning if they're home workers. And they use systems. So explain to me where, what part of their day are they going to use the system and how they're going to use it? Right? Generally, people have got more than enough systems anyway. I was speaking to someone recently. Who, who they calculated, I think, that their team were logging into 25 different systems or they were expected to to do their work. And yeah, no yeah. no one's realistically going to do that. No, no, you, you're exactly right. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, and, and actually, it's, it's I mean, uh, I, I suppose the, uh, the the right terminology for this is, is the user journey, right? Try and take a take a role. So, so you know, the pe people would call it. Uh, I think in the UX kind of vernacular, they'd call it a persona-driven approach, right? Envisage the the persona, the type of person in an organization that's gonna that's gonna execute this workflow, and and live with them in their journey as they go through all the different systems to get their work done. That is probably the biggest mistake that uh, that people make. Mark, absolutely fascinating speaking to you today. Thank you so much for your time. No, thanks, Luke. All the best. A big thank you to Mark Boswell for sharing those insights. For more information on the digital CMC framework, you can head to ngtbiopharmaconsultants.com. And a thank you to our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific.